All right, so thank you everyone who's joining us this evening for our May TAP Talk. Um, my name is Ashley D'Antonio. I help to organize the TAP Talks for the 500 Women Scientists Group here in Corvallis. And so just as some background, in case you don't know, the 500 Women Scientists pod here in Corvallis partners with Block 15 for these TAP Talks. We used to be in person at Block 15, um, but now we're remote on Zoom. We appreciate you joining us and sticking with us through these TAP Talks. These are part of the way that the 500 Women Scientists Groups works towards our mission of making science more open, inclusive, and accessible. So we're highlighting women scientists here in the Corvallis community and helping you all learn about the great work that they do. If you wanna learn more about our organization, we do have a website. I can put that in the chat later for folks that are interested. But I'm really, really excited to present our speaker for this evening, Yvonne Rerica. She is a PhD candidate in the Environmental and Molecular Toxicology Department at Oregon State, where she works with Dr. Robin Tangway in the laboratory that investigates the toxicology of PFAS using zebrafish. Yvonne is originally from Idaho, but got her undergraduate degree in biology from St. John's University in New York, where she also played on their NCAA Division I softball team. Yvonne has worked as a biological fieldwork technician conducting stream surveys to assess fish and amphibian distributions in Idaho and Oregon, as well as a laboratory technician for the Clorox company in their cleaning research and development division. Her passion for the environment and interests in the intersection between chemistry and biology led, to her, led her to pursue a graduate degree in toxicology. So with that, I will have you go ahead and share your screen of on and we can get started. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction, Ashley. Let me, no matter how many times I do this, it's always a struggle. Okay. Oh, you're probably seeing the wrong view right now, huh? Yeah, I think we're seeing, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I promise I practiced this before we started. <laughs> okay, how's that? That's perfect. Okay, awesome, thank you. Um, so once again, Ashley, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here and talking to you all about my research uh, using zebrafish as a model organism to investigate PFAS toxicity. Uh, so before I jump right into my talk, I'd like to just give a general roadmap of where we'll be going today. Uh, so we'll start off by talking about uh, what PFAS are, uh, what we know about their toxicity, and then I'll share a little bit about my research and uh, what we've found from our experiments. And then we'll wrap up in the end by looking at some of the current regulations and sharing some resources that you can use to look at uh, PFAS a little bit more if you want to. And I should also preface, <clears throat> Ashley mentioned this um, in the trivia before the talk, but in the spirit of Star Wars Day, which is today, May the 4th, I will have some Star Wars related <laughs> images throughout my talk. So for the people who may watch this in the future uh, recorded, uh, that is why <laughs> I am nerding out just a little bit. Um, so thinking about uh, what PFAS are, PFAS stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. Um, and they are man-made chemicals that are characterized by uh, these carbon fluorine bonds. And these bonds are really unique. They're one of the shortest and strongest bonds known. Um, and they impart really um, beneficial properties to the PFAS when we're using them in certain products. Uh, but unfortunately, they also make it so that these PFAS can be highly persistent in the environment and also resistant to degradation and metabolism. So uh, that's really the root of where the term forever chemicals comes from. It's because they're really persistent in the environment. Once they get out there, uh, they tend to stick around for a long time. And just a couple examples of PFAS. 
uh, that you've probably seen in the news. These are some of the uh, two of the most well-known PFAS. Uh, on the left, you see perfluorooctane sulfonic acid or PFOS, and on the right, perfluorooctanoic acid or PFOA. Uh, and as you can see, they have these carbon fluorine bonds that we just mentioned, um, and they form a fully fluorinated carbon chain. And then on the right hand side, there are these two different functional head groups. Um, but we won't talk about them too much right now. We'll come back to these two chemicals. And I want to start by looking at uh, what the origins of PFAS are. So they were first developed in the 1930s and the 1940s. Uh, they were actually accidentally discovered in 1938. Um, a scientist from DuPont was doing some um, experiments to try to find new options uh, for refrigerant chemicals. And he was conducting experiments and actually found that at the end of one of his experiments in one of his containers, there was this uh, white substance that he didn't expect to see. And so he looked into it a little bit more and it ended up being uh, polytetrafluoroethylene or PTFE. Um, and PTFE had, um, was later formulated into and trademarked as Teflon, which you might be familiar with. Um, but he was looking into this PTFE more and he realized that it had really incredible uh, chemical properties uh, because of the, those carbon fluorine bonds. Um, so he found that they were incredibly stable. He found that they were really resistant to heat and other chemicals and also electricity. And they had really unique nonstick um, friction uh, lowering properties. So because of these really um, amazing properties that they had, they were developed into a variety of different kinds of products. Things like nonstick cookware, uh, automotive parts, and also in insulated wiring. Uh, one of the interesting um, uses that I read about was that they were specifically used in insulated wiring for spacecraft. Uh, and they've also been historically formulated into firefighting foams. Um, and once again, um, nerding out just a little bit, uh, I would imagine that if there were PFAS in the Star Wars universe, it might be likely that R2-D2 might have some PFAS insulated wiring inside of him. Um, but bringing it back to uh, some of the things that PFAS have been manufactured into that are uh, might be a little closer to home. They've also been manufactured into things like food packaging, things that we want to be water and grease resistant. Uh, so you can think of popcorn bags or carry out containers. And they've also been used as uh, surface coatings for things like textiles, including carpets, uh, furniture, outdoor gear, um, and various types of clothing. Um, and they have additionally been used in things like cosmetics and personal care products. So they're really used in a wide variety of uh, products and they've been manufactured really widely. So uh, inevitably they have ended up in the environment. Um, and once they're in the environment, we already heard that they're pretty persistent. Um, but another key point is that certain PFAS can be really highly mobile in the environment. So they can move very long distances. So if we think about, uh, for example, PFAS being emitted into the air, uh, certain PFAS um, are able to be transported really far distances in the air and the atmosphere, and then they can be deposited at locations really far away from where they were initially released into the environment. Um, PFAS can also end up in things like surface waters, uh, which include rivers and lakes, and eventually the ocean, um, and they can end up in groundwater. Um, and a, another significant point is that they can eventually end up in biota, like wildlife or uh, farm animals or inside of us as humans. Uh, so because of their um, being released into the environment and their high mobility, um, something interesting is that they've been found in really remote locations. Um, so this is a study by uh, Jean et al, 2017. Um, and you don't have to worry about all of the little details in this figure, but the important thing is that Jean et al uh, combined a lot of different studies that had looked at PFAS in the Arctic seawater. Um, and they found that ver a variety of studies found that PFAS were detected in these very remote locations. 
um, throughout the Arctic. So once again, not only are those PFAS being detected uh, right at sites where they might be being released, uh, but they're being found uh, at locations around the globe, really. Um, another really interesting study that just recently came out uh, shows that PFAS have been detected in samples taken from Mount Everest. Um, and they interestingly found that this was likely a result of both um, humans uh, traveling through Mount Everest and recreating there, um, but also, once again, as a result of that atmospheric deposition of PFAS being um, transferred, transmitted through the environment, uh, transported through the atmosphere, and then deposited onto Mount Everest. Uh, so they're really ubiquitous. They're found around the world. Um, and as a result of this, there's also high frequency of PFAS being detected in humans. Um, so some of the primary routes that we're exposed to PFAS through are, once again, those consumer goods, like we talked about before, um, and then also through various routes of them getting into the environment, we can then be exposed through things like drinking water and food and also indoor air and dust. So there's a general concern about um, widespread exposure to PFAS. Um, at potentially low chronic levels. Um, and then in addition to this, there's also a concern that some PFAS have been found to be bioaccumulative. So that means that they can accumulate inside of us. Um, and some of them have really slow elimination half-lives uh, on the order of three to five years. So there's also this potential that certain PFAS can um, stick inside of us and the concentrations inside of us could increase, which might increase the risk that we would actually um, experience adverse health effects as a result of PFAS exposures. Um, so along those lines, uh, ooh, <laughs> um, transitioning into what we actually know about PFAS toxicity. Before I jump right into PFAS, I wanna talk about just how we know about chemical toxicity in general. Um, and so that is the focus of the field of toxicology. Um, and the main goal of toxicology is to understand the harmful effects that chemicals and substances can have on people, animals, and the environment. So I wanna to touch on just a couple of key concepts in toxicology before we move on to the rest of the presentation. And the first of those concepts is that the dose makes the poison. So this is a concept that we're all probably familiar with. We just might not have heard this exact phrasing before. So it's the idea that uh, if we're exposed to, say, uh, if we take two shots of alcohol, uh, we would not expect to have the same effects as if we took, say, eight shots of alcohol. So the amount of substance that we're exposed to and that gets inside of us has a really big impact on the effects that we might observe. Um, and similarly, we wouldn't expect similar doses in different chemicals to uh, cause the same effects. So the dose that might cause a toxic effect uh, is likely to be different based on the chemical that we're exposed to. Uh, and secondly, I also want to touch on the fact that in order to uh, determine whether a chemical poses a risk to human and environmental health, we have to think about uh, two main things. First being that um, we need to know how much we're exposed to. And then on the other side of things, we need to know what the effects are and at what concentrations those effects happen. So all of this leads into toxicology and our ability to tell whether a chemical is a significant risk or not. And so thinking about PFAS, Various toxicology studies um, have addressed whether PFAS cause health effects. And um, a really wide range of health effects have been shown to be caused by PFAS or associated with PFAS. And uh, some of these include things like thyroid disease or endocrine disruption, um, lipid dysregulation. So certain studies have found uh, increased cholesterol levels associated with high concentrations of PFAS. They also have been found to cause liver damage and various um, immune effects and also reproductive and developmental outcomes such as lower birth weights. 
Uh, so we know there's a wide range of health effects, once again, associated with PFAS, uh, but the vast majority of these studies have primarily been focused on just these two PFAS, the PFOS and PFOA that we were introduced to earlier. And that's, um, that's a problem because these two PFAS are just two among a really huge chemical class. Uh, so the OECD uh, chemical inventory reports that there are more than 4,000 substances that fall into the PFAS class. Uh, so there's really a great need for studying uh, more PFAS so we can get a better understanding of uh, what different PFAS cause effects, whether they're similar to PFAS and PFOA, or maybe whether they're different. Um, so in addition to there being a large number of PFAS, uh, there are also a variety of different kinds of structures. So once again, the uh, details in this figure aren't super important. Just take away that there are a lot of PFAS and they fall into a variety of structural categories. So if we think about what kinds of structural features can change from one PFAS to another, uh, I'll direct your attention to PFAS here on the right-hand side of the slide. And once again, you'll remember that it has this fully fluorinated carbon chain and this sulfonic acid functional head group. Um, but some of the other kinds of structures we might see uh, include shorter chain PFAS. So PFAS has eight fluorinated carbons, um, whereas if we look at 4,2 FTS, it only has four fluorinated carbons. Um, so that difference in chain length can be significant for how mobile the PFAS is and also potentially for how toxic it is. Um, if we look at Gen X here on the bottom, we can see that it has a different functional head group than the chemicals above it. So it has a carboxylic acid, whereas these other two chemicals have the sulfonic acid functional head groups. And Gen X also has another uh, additional difference, uh, which is the addition of this ether bond, so this oxygen thrown into the middle of the chemical here. Uh, so I want to mainly just uh, use these as examples to, sh to show how PFAS structures can vary. Um, and also I want to make the note that these shorter chain PFAS are generally thought of as safer alternatives to those longer chain legacy PFAS like PFAS and PFOA. Um, so they're generally thought of as safer, but uh, we still really need a lot more information about their toxicity. So once again, take home message here is that there are thousands of structurally diverse PFAS, uh, but we only have robust toxicological data for some of them, which is where my project comes in. So uh, we use zebrafish to investigate PFAS toxicity. And when we're thinking about investigating um, chemicals in general, uh, we're all exposed to so many chemicals every day. There are thousands, tens of thousands of chemicals out in the environment. Um, and I don't say that to uh, cause alarm, but it's just kind of the fact that there are a lot of chemicals out there. And so we need to work to understand better uh, which chemicals pose high risk to human health or not. Um, and a lot of those chemicals aren't going to pose risk because either we're not exposed to them at high enough concentrations or because they're not toxic at the concentrations that we are exposed to. But thinking about the huge number of chemicals that there are out there, there are a couple different ways that we can go about trying to test the chemicals that we want to test. Uh, so if you look on the left-hand side of this slide, we can conduct human population-based studies. Um, and while these are really relevant to humans, uh, they are really low throughput. So we can only conduct a couple of studies per year just because so much goes into them. So it's not really feasible to test thousands of chemicals this way. It would take us a really long time. Uh, so if we move one step to the right, uh, there's also an animal model option, which is the standard rodent testing. Um, and so these are still pretty relevant to humans. They're mammals like we are, um, and we can test more chemicals using this model. But, excuse my dogs in the background. <laughs> um, but we still aren't really as close as we need to be to those thousands of chemicals when we can only test 10 to 100 per year. And in addition to this, there is the ethical problem of uh, conducting animal testing. 
So ideally, what we'd really like to do and what the field is moving in the direction of is if I direct your attention to the right hand side of the slide is cell based testing and computer modeling. So the field is moving in the direction of being able to use cell testing and computer modeling and able to in order to evaluate chemicals and see whether they actually pose a risk to human and environmental health and see whether we should how we should regulate them. Um, and Fortunately, the general consensus is, consensus is right now that we're just not quite there yet. We just don't have enough information to be able to solely rely on these types of models. Uh, biology and biological chemical interactions are so complex uh, that we're just not quite there yet. So that's where alternative animal models come in like zebrafish. Uh, and they really help us bridge the gap between these standard rodent models and these other types of assays. Um, and they are still pretty relevant to humans, like we'll get into, and they enable us to test a large number of chemicals. So zebrafish enable us to uh, rapidly test a large number of chemicals because they are relatively easy to maintain in the lab. Uh, one spawning pair of fish can produce hundreds of embryos. So if we get a small group of fish uh, together and spawn them, we can get thousands of embryos that are all developing at the same time that we can then put into our testing in order to evaluate chemicals. And in addition to this, zebrafish develop transparently. So we can take a fish and put it under the microscope and we can actually see it real time and non-invasively uh, watch the biology as it happens and see whether chemical interactions are throwing the biology askew. And finally, zebrafish developed from a newly fertilized embryo, as you can see up here on the right hand side of the slide, uh, to a freely swimming larval fish in just five days, which is pretty incredible. Um, so on the next slide, I will actually play a video for you of zebrafish development. And um, before I start it, I just want to point out that over here on this pole of the embryo, you can see that there are two cells, just two cells. And as soon as I start the video, those will start to rapidly divide. So here we go. Um, and so you can see those cells rapidly dividing and spreading. And then you can see by uh, 12 and especially 20 hours after fertilization, you can already see that head and that tail of the fish forming. So it's really incredible how quickly the zebrafish do develop. I'm just gonna play that video for you one more time because it's so cool. <laughs> um, so within just a short amount of time, 24 hours uh, or even five days, we can look at this really huge critical window in biology. And this helps us to test a lot of chemicals within just a short amount of time. And not only are they really good models because of these reasons, but they're also more like humans than you might think. Uh, so they're really relevant for human health research. And this is um, greatly in part because during that early development period, the biology of that development period is highly conserved uh, between vertebrate species. And this means that zebrafish also have the same major organs and tissues that we do. So you can see that pictured in the figure on the left-hand side of the slide. And also, in addition to that, they have significant genetic homology with humans. So 70% of human protein coding genes have similar genes in zebrafish. And that percentage goes even higher up to 80% when we think about the human genes that are known to be associated with human diseases. So when we get down to that um, gene level, when we're looking at chemical biological interactions, the likelihood that there will be a gene in zebrafish that is similar to the gene in humans is pretty high. So zebrafish are a really good model for toxicology and for looking at human health. And as an example, we can think about alcohol. So we're all used to seeing on our wine bottles and our beer bottles, uh, this warning saying that it's not recommended that women consume alcohol while they're pregnant because we know that ethanol exposure can cause fetal alcohol spectrum disorders in humans, uh, things like birth defects and uh, learning disorders. Uh, and of course, this depends a lot on the concentration that's consumed. 
Um, but we interestingly also see that ethanol causes effects in zebrafish. So if you look in panel A, we can see a control fish here on the bottom that hasn't been exposed to ethanol. And then as you move up, as the concentration of ethanol increases, you can see that there are more and more um, malformations happening in the fish. And panel B shows um, very similarly, just that as concentration on the x-axis increases, uh, the malformations on the y-axis also increase. So just an example that uh, zebrafish and humans are maybe more similar than we might think initially. And so now I will talk you through the actual exposure and testing setup that we use in our lab. Um, so you can see there's a timeline of zebrafish development in the middle of the screen, going from just newly fertilized all the way up until five days. And the, um, the exposure setup starts with egg collection in the morning, um, and then followed by at six hours after they've been fertilized, we put the zebrafish into 96 well plates. So as you can see here is 96 well plate. And so in each of these individual little wells, one embryo will be placed. And we actually in the Tangway lab have a really amazing automated system where robots will actually carefully suck up an embryo and place it into the 96 well plates. Uh, so it's pretty incredible. And once we have the zebrafish in the 96 well plates, then we can add our chemical. And then they sit for um, a certain amount of time until we do our assessments. And so at one day and at five days, we can look at their development and their behavior to see whether the chemicals are having an effect on the zebrafish. So thinking about first development, we can look for those malformations like we saw in the last slide, um, things like um, malformations related to the brain area, to the heart area, um, to the muscle or to the tail and the axis of the fish. And we'll see some more examples of that later. Um, but we can also look at the behavior, which is interesting because we might not see on the outside of the fish any effect, but then when we look at their behavior, the chemical could be causing um, some changes in their biology that weren't, um, weren't apparent just based on looking at them. So as an example, at five days, we have a photomotor behavior assay, which essentially means that we um, expose the fish to a stimulus that is light and we see how they react in terms of their movement. So if you look in this plot on the right-hand side, uh, during the light period of the assay, uh, the movement is relatively low. And then during the dark period of the assay, the movement gets higher and that's expected based on control fish behavior. And then we can compare the control fish behavior to the behavior of fish that have been treated with chemicals. And we can see whether they're different, which would indicate that maybe the chemicals are having an effect on the biology. And so this is the standard testing setup that we use in our lab. And now I will jump into going back to our problem of having a lot of PFAS and needing to test them. So we first wanted to start out by looking at PFAS from a number of different structural categories. So you can see um, those carboxylic acids, which might sound familiar. They have a carboxylic acid functional head group, sulfonic acids. Uh, we also have sulfonamides. So a bunch of different uh, functional head groups and then a variety of other structural features that are also different between these uh, classes. And so our ultimate goal testing PFAS from all of these different classes is to ultimately identify structure bioactivity relationships. And that is, um, our goal is to identify certain structural features. Uh, so maybe it's a functional head group, maybe it's a certain chain length uh, that is predictive of toxic and outcomes that we're observing in our assays. So these structure bioactivity relationships are important to identify and understand because they can help us to uh, predict the toxicity of the PFAS that we haven't tested yet can flag a certain structural feature as more or as predictive of toxic outcomes, uh, then we can have a better idea of maybe what we would want to regulate or what manufacturers might want to select when they're 
choosing products or choosing PFAS to put into their products. Uh, so by flagging those PFAS with um, more likely to be toxic chemical features, we can inform safer selection of PFAS. And this also comes in when we think about green chemistry. So if PFAS, new PFAS are being designed, they can be designed in a safer way if we have a good understanding of these structure bioactivity relationships. So jumping into study one, once again, we wanted to look at a large number of PFAS from a bunch of different structural categories. So we ended up looking at 58 individual PFAS from 14 categories. And we focused on just a single concentration. And the concentration we selected uh, for all of these PFAS would be on par with um, very high levels of certain PFAS detected in the environment. And we also decided to focus on behavior effects because these complex behavior effects are very sensitive indicators of whether the chemistry is having an effect on the biology. Jumping into some of the results that we found, I'll first orient you to the heat map a little bit. So on the very top of the heat map, you can see all of the individual PFAS that we tested. Uh, you don't have to read all those. I know this font's a little bit small, um, but the important thing is that they all fit into these 14 structural categories. Um, and within those categories, we have um, shorter chain PFAS on the left and longer chain PFAS on the right. So looking at our actual results, in terms of mortality, we didn't observe any effects in mortality caused by the chemicals at either one day or five days. And we also, looking at um, behavior that we tested at one day, we didn't see any effects there either. But then when we looked at behavior at five days, we actually saw a relatively good number of effects, or I should say, 36% of the 58 PFAS that we tested caused a behavior effect at five days. And the interesting thing, <clears throat> behavior effect indicated by the colored cells in the heat map. Um, and so the interesting thing is that these behavior effects were um, spanned across multiple structural categories. So it wasn't focused on just say one or two structural categories, uh, but it really spanned across a wide range of them. Um, and additionally, something interesting is that we saw behavior effects in these shorter chain PFAS, uh, those ones that I said are typically thought of as uh, safer alternatives. Uh, we saw behavior effects in them as well as the longer chain PFAS. So uh, seeing these, uh, this range of effects at very, in various structural categories, we next wanted to focus in on just a couple of them and test them at several concentrations. So we decided to choose five structural categories and that consisted of a total of 25 PFAS. So you can see in the table here, um, our 25 PFAS and those five structural categories, those carboxylic acids and sulfonic acids, which should sound familiar by now, and then some sulfonamides, and then a group of fluorotelomer sulfonic acids, uh, which if you remember, um, are not fully fluorinated. They have a couple of carbons that still have hydrogens on them instead of fluorines. And then um, some ether and polyether compounds with those oxygen bonds thrown into the middle of the chemicals. And we tested across a range of concentrations from zero to 100 micromolar. And to orient you to this concentration, um, the concentration that we tested in the previous study was approximately in the like 0.1 to one micromolar range. And those are on par with really high levels detected in the environment for certain PFAS. So our low range was really high levels detected in the environment and we extended into this higher concentration range range so we could really investigate what the PFAS were doing to the zebrafish biology. And once again, another heat map, I'll orient you really quickly. So on the right hand side, there are the 25 PFAS that we tested and their structural categories that they fell into. And then on the bottom here, you can see all of the endpoints that we tested. And so some of these on the left hand side of this line, uh, were for morphology. So we were looking at malformations and once again, things like the brain, the muscle, uh, the 
uh, tails and axis. And on the right hand side of this line are the behavior assays. So we have the uh, one day behavior assay and then the five day behavior assay. And the colors within the heat map um, are indicative of the concentration at which we saw an effect. So you can think of the dark blue colors as being um, more toxic because at lower concentrations, uh, we saw an effect. Whereas if you look at the purple and the pink colored uh, cells, that means that we saw effects only at higher concentrations. So not quite as toxic. And so if we step through some of the results that we found, we identified sulfonamides as particularly bioactive, especially when looking at all of these morphological endpoints. And interestingly, they were also the only group to uh, cause one day behavior effects. Moving on to the sulfonic acids, they were also uh, relatively bioactive. Uh, several of them induced morphological effects. Um, but these two chemical classes compared to the carboxylic acids and the fluorotelmer sulfonic acids, um, there's a pretty stark difference that you see. So in these two classes, we don't see really any morphological effects for the most part, but we do see uh, five-day behavior effects. And then if we move on to the last subclass, the ethers and polyethers, it's really a mixed bag for, for this class. So PFMOAA, we saw a five-day behavior effect. Gen X, we didn't see any effect in our assays. And this other compound, Nafion byproduct 2, we actually saw quite a bit of morphological effects. And so given the results that we found in these uh, first two studies, we found that some PFAS did induce uh, malformations, some PFAS did cause behavior effects, uh, but what we really wanted to get at next was uh, how they were causing these effects. So we wanted to investigate the mode of toxic action that the PFAS were working through. And we decided to do this using RNA sequencing, which is a really cool tool. So I'll actually uh, walk you through RNA sequencing in case you're not familiar with it. Um, but backing up a little bit from there, I wanna start with the central dogma of molecular biology. So we start with our DNA, which is located in the nuclei of our cells, and that has uh, the blueprints that tell our body how to function and how to be who we are. And then though that DNA gets transcribed into mRNA, which is essentially just copies of our DNA. And that mRNA goes outside of the nucleus into the rest of the cell and is the information that the cell uses to actually uh, translate into polypeptides and proteins. Uh, so making those proteins that we can actually use to um, help the cell to function. So what we're really interested in RNA sequencing is this mRNA. And we can actually collect the DNA and uh, stick it in a tube like so and put it through a couple of processing steps. And then we can send our sample to a lab to sequence. Uh, so they actually read all of the individual bases on that mRNA and send us back these sequenced reads. And then we can map those onto our zebrafish genome to see what genes those mRNA came from. And once we have that, we can get an idea of which genes the chemical exposure is turning on and turning off. And this can tell us a lot about what kinds of biological processes are being affected. Um, certain genes might be uh, really related to say brain development or metabolism. And so uh, using RNA sequencing is a really powerful tool because we can look at the entirety of all of those mRNA in a zebrafish, compare a chemically treated fish to a control fish and see exactly what the differences are that the PFAS are causing. And so a couple of key takeaways from my research are that in the first study where we looked at a large number of PFAS across um, multiple structural subclasses, at one concentration, we saw that 36% of the PFAS caused behavior effects at five days. We uh, noticed that this was across multiple structural subclasses, and we also saw that we saw behavior effects from both longer chain and shorter chain PFAS. 
And then in study two, we saw that uh, the sulfonamides were particularly bioactive and that bioactivity profiles between the PFAS uh, were different. So they weren't all the same. And finally, in study three, which is still in progress, uh, the RNA sequencing, we're actually um, in the midst of preparing for that right now, which I'm really excited about. <laughs> um, we can use RNA sequencing to investigate how PFAS are actually causing the effects that we're seeing. And so that's wrapping up my research, but now I'd like to end my talk by talking about some of the current regulations for PFAS and then uh, also some resources that you can use uh, to look up some information on your own. So the current US regulations, <clears throat> well, actually let me even back up from there. So uh, PFAS and PFOA, those legacy PFAS have actually been voluntarily phased out by a lot of manufacturers uh, since um, in the last couple decades. And then in 2016, the US EPA uh, issued a drinking water health advisory for PFOS and PFOA of 70 parts per trillion. Um, so if some of you remember from the trivia before the talk, um, I know not everyone was there. So 70 parts per trillion, a good analogy for that that I've seen used a lot is uh, 70 parts per trillion is equivalent to one drop of water uh, in a in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools. So one drop of water in 20 Olympic sized swimming pools, it's actually like pretty small amount. <laughs> um, but the EPA issued this health advisory for PFAS and PFOA, which means that it's not actually regulated, it's just an advisory. Um, and so They've been working on gathering more information on PFAS um, and actually just this year recently, uh, the EPA announced that it will implement a national drinking water regulation for PFAS and PFOA, um, hopefully within the next year. Um, and in addition to this, several states have also uh, implemented stricter advisories. Um, several also have higher advisories, um, so less strict. Um, just depending on the state. But as of this year or into next year, uh, the US EPA should be announcing a actual drinking water regulation. And I also wanted to touch on a, an interesting topic and thinking about how we should actually regulate PFAS. Uh, so there's a really good paper by Cousins et al 2020 that talks about um, the different kinds of ways that we can regulate PFAS. Uh, and these include uh, how bioaccumulative they are, how toxic they are, how mobile in the environment they are. Um, but ultimately the argument that Cousins et al was making is that uh, nearly all PFAS in the PFAS chemical class are persistent based on that carbon and fluorine bonds that they have. Um, and so the argument that Cousins et al made and many others are making is that PFAS should be uh, regulated based on their persistence alone. Um, and there's a bit of a debate about this because PFAS is such a broad structural class that not all PFAS are going to be alike in terms of, uh, once again, the mobility in the environment or the toxicity that they cause. So uh, I'm not here to tell you which is the best option, but I thought it was interesting to bring up so that you can uh, know that this um, debate about how to regulate PFAS is happening. And in addition to this, there's a concept of essentially an essentiality um, that is also explained really well in another paper by Cousins et al. And the idea is that we can use the idea of essentiality of PFAS uses to guide our decisions about which PFAS should be, uh, which PFAS uses should be phased out and which ones uh, might be necessary to keep. Um, and this is especially important as <clears throat> not a lot of regulations exist right now. So uh, the essentiality, um, if we think about essential uses, those are things that are necessary for the health or safety uh, of our society and the people in it. Um, so this could include things like certain medical devices or occupational protective clothing that use PFAS, uh, things that are really essential and that we don't have uh, PFAS alternatives for. 
And if we think about uh, another class, if it's not essential uses, uh, it could be a substitutable use. So something in which the actual use and function of that PFAS is really essential, uh, but there are alternatives available. Um, so for most aqueous foam forming foams, for example, and for some water resistant textiles, there are other kinds of chemistry besides PFAS that we can use to uh, fulfill these functions. And then finally, uh, there are the non-essential uses, uh, which uh, cousin, Cousins et al. describes as not essential for health and safety. Uh, we can think about these as um, maybe things that are more for, say, recreation, like use of PFAS in ski waxes or water repellent recreational clothing. Um, and Finally, I want to share some resources that you can use uh, to do some further research, research if you'd like to. Um, there's a really good map, interactive map, uh, from the Environmental Working Group, where you can go to this map at this link at the bottom of the page, uh, and we can send these links out to everyone in an email following the talk, uh, if that's of interest. But you can visit this map and you can click on your uh, location on the US or any other location and it will tell you the highest detected uh, PFAS levels uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so this is a really good way to kind of get a sense of what kinds of PFAS uh, activity might be in your area, uh, whether you might be more concerned about your drinking water and the PFAS levels in it. Uh, so I highly recommend you go and check this out. There's also a really cool uh, PFAS database that just recently came up and I am still in the midst of checking it out myself. Um, but if you're interested in the toxicity studies that have been done with various PFAS, you can go here and you can check out the kinds of studies, uh, whether they were uh, human-based, animal-based, or in vitro uh, cell tests. Um, and you can get a sense for what we know about each individual PFAS based on those tests. And if you are uh, especially concerned about PFAS exposure, I also wanted to include just some ways that you could reduce your exposure if you'd like to. Uh, so things like um, installing water filtration systems or just using water filtration, uh, this could be especially important if you are in a place where uh, your drinking water does have higher levels of PFAS. And um, in addition to filtering your water, you can also reduce consumption of food that comes in carryout containers and wrappers. Uh, so thinking about those PFAS that we might be exposed to through our diet. You can also um, avoid PTFE-based nonstick cookware and kitchen utensils. Uh, you could opt for alternatives like, say, cast iron. And you can also do a lot of research into your products uh, and also specifically your personal care products. So there are a couple of good websites that I've included here. Um, PFAScentral.org has a PFAS free uh, products site where you can go and look at manufacturers that have gone PFAS free. Um, and personal care products, you can look at the Environmental Working Group's uh, Skin Deep website where you can look at either an individual personal care product or you can search a, a chemical or say a phrase like perfluoro to see what kinds of products come up when you search uh, that chemical or phrase. And I took um, several of these from the Environmental Working Group's Guide to Avoiding PFAS. So you can also look that up line, online if you'd like. And so with that, I would like to finish up with just some acknowledgements of uh, the amazing people that have made the research that I do possible. Um, so particularly the Tangway Lab and especially my PI, Dr. Robin Tangway and also Drs. Lisa Trong and Michael Simonich and uh, all of the Tangway Lab who are absolutely amazing. Um, also the Field Lab who is a really close collaborator, Dr. Jennifer Field and Duncan Cow, uh, all of our other collaborators at various other universities. And of course, my funding sources at the EPA and the NIH who have made this research possible. And of course, a final huge last thank you to all of the fish that have contributed to our science. So thank you all so much for listening. And I would love to take any questions that you might have. 
Thank you so much for that wonderful talk, Yvonne. I know this is the part where we all should be clapping for you. Um, so that was that was excellent. And we have 10 or 15 minutes for Q&A. If folks have questions for Yvonne, you can um, put the questions in the chat and I will help to moderate that. And I'm glad that Vic also noticed the Star Wars end credits theme. That was very impressive. And that was, that was <laughs> wonderful for your acknowledgments. I will not tell you how long it took me to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I guess I have a question just to get you started while folks are putting other questions in the chat. Um, yeah. I'm curious about what, I mean, I know you use zebrafish as, you know, your, your study species is, what is your favorite thing about them? <laughs> like besides like the, like the, what you talked about and how we're able to kind of do all these different, run all these different chemicals and be able to, you know, analyze a lot of different impacts, but is there anything else you like or find really interesting about zebrafish? Yeah, I think um, this is probably a very surface level, level answer, um, but they are incredibly beautiful to look at, <laughs> um, especially when you're up close and trying to tell the males and the females apart, you get to see all of the beautiful colors that they have, and I, I think that's one of one of my favorite parts about working with them is just how beautiful they are. Yeah. That's a great answer. Does anyone have any questions for Yvonne? I have another question. So you in, you know, in re oh, wait, we got one. It's okay. Um, <laughs> I have another one. I'll save it. So there's a question from Jacqueline safe brands of dental floss and does Gore-Tex have PFAS and what waterproof clothing doesn't? So there's a couple of questions there, right? So um, do you have any recommendations for safe brands of dental floss? And the second question is about Gore-Tex and uh, PFAS and other waterproof clothing options. Oh, that's a good question. I actually do not have um, good recommendations off the top of my head. Um, <clears throat> But let me see. Oh, my screens are not happy at the moment. Um, I will post the links as soon as my screens cooperate um, to the one website that I mentioned. Um, and it has a lot of good recommendations. I think it specifically has information on floss and also outdoor gear. Um, so I'm sorry, I don't know those off the top of my head, but as soon as I can, I will post that in the chat. Hey, thanks. Uh, we have a question from Deb. Uh, Deb says this was super. This was super just very important. How will this information get to um, regulators? So how how does the results of your study kind of get out there? That's a good question. Um, I think so. We will, we're planning, I mean, I guess initially um, the primary way that you can get uh, information out there is just by publishing. So we will be publishing our results so that other researchers and the public can see them. Um, and then I think also <laughs> by doing talks like this, I think is really important to share your science and what you find. Um, so I guess a combination of publishing and I'll be presenting at a lot of conferences so that we can share the results that way. Um, and then once again, hopefully talks like these help get it out there too. Great, thank you. Next question from Zach. If we stopped using all PFAS products today, do you know how long it would take until PFAS was not detectable in the ocean or other areas of nature? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, so I don't quote me on the dates, but I around 2000 um, in the US, PFAS and PFO were um, voluntarily phased out by most companies. Um, and so it's been two decades since they've been phased out um, and they're still detected really highly in a lot of environmental samples. Um, so it definitely depends on the actual PFAS. Um, and some PFAS are degraded into other PFAS. Um, so 
uh, if they're not fully fluorinated, like if they have some carbons that aren't fluorinated or if they have those oxygens uh, thrown into their chemi chemistries, uh, they can more easily be degraded into kind of other kind of terminal, terminal uh, PFAS structures. Um, but yeah, those structures like PFOS and PFOA are incredibly persistent. There are ways that PFAS can be broken down. So they're, they're not forever chemicals in that they can't be destroyed. Um, it's just very difficult to destroy them. Um, so I know there's a lot of really interesting work right now um, looking into uh, say bioremediation bio techniques. So using uh, microbes to break down PFAS I think there's a lot of really uh, interesting work that says they have found some microbes, but uh, it's kind of on the lab bench scale and it would be hard to, and they're in the process of kind of scaling that up to see if they could actually apply it in the real world. Um, and I think there are a lot of other techniques like that where they're using um, electrochemical techniques to break down PFAS. Um, but the, the big problem is scaling it up so that they can actually use those techniques. Thanks for that response. We have another question from Deb. Any companies who manufacture products with high bioavailability that we could boycott or you know, manufacturing products you think we need to avoid? Adding that second part to expand the question a little. Um, yeah, I think it's, again, I think I don't have any off the top of my head. And I think it's a very personal decision about um, making a call about which PFAS, um, because some, P, some people think that no PFAS should be used. Some people think that we should use, um, say, the information we have about how toxic they are to determine what should be used. Um, so I think it's a really personal decision about which companies you might want to boycott based on what they use. Um, and sometimes it can be hard to tell what they use because a lot of that is proprietary information. Um, so I, I Again, don't have a good answer off the top of my head for that. Sorry. Um, but I'm still trying to get my computer to come up with that link for companies that are PFAS free. Jacqueline had a, a comment, but I, I'm going to turn it into a question. So mm -hmm. Jacqueline said, seems as though there could be a connection between PFAS exposure and hyperactivity in children. Have you seen any studies that have shown that or anything related in, in, you know, in your background research on this topic? I have read some really interesting studies. Um, one in particular, I can't remember the authors, um, did find associations with uh, higher PFAS concentrations and things like uh, ADHD in children um, and other learning outcomes uh, like certain uh, delayed um, behavior or de when you um, make a, what's it called when you uh, have like a, a learning milestone. Um, a certain study found that PFAS concentrations were associated with learning milestones being delayed. Um, but the hard thing about that is there's not a lot of studies that are all um, corroborating that. There's a lot of conflicting information in the data. So it's really hard to make a definitive call about whether that's actually um, a true association between PFAS and say child behavior. Um, there are also studies that haven't found any correlations. So there is some evidence, but it's, it's not super conclusive. Thanks. So we have a, two questions from Gigi, so I'm going to um, break them up. But first, Gigi says, thanks for such a fun and informative talk. So much interesting and hard work and all your results. So the first question is, what would be some priority application areas where, oh man, I'm going to butcher this because I don't do anything chemically related. <laughs> so, so fulnamides are used in a substitutable, essential sort of way. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so sulfonamides, based on my um, reading, um, again, I, th I think it's sometimes difficult because of the um, proprietary information that chem uh, companies might not want to share. Um, but in general, the sulfonamides are known to be used in um, surface coatings for stain resistance, um, and also some industrial uses. Um, 
so I think that um, if we were thinking about um, sulfonamides being used in contact, food contact paper, and I am not 100% sure that they are, um, but if they were, there are a lot of alternatives like, um, ooh, uh, certain types of um, cellulose-based technologies um, that also impart a lot of grease resistance, um, but that aren't based on these fluorinated um, chemistries. So I would imagine uh, things like, um, like cellulose-based technologies, or even um, a lot of alternatives are hydrocarbon-based, um, which depending on the hydrocarbon you use, it could have its own slew of issues. <laughs> um, but there, I think there are definitely technologies for uh, substituting out the sulfonamides. Um, just, I think a lot of studies haven't covered the sulfonamides yet. Um, so I think as more information comes in about the sulfonamide toxicity, uh, we might see that coming to the forefront more. Thanks. The second question from Gigi was, with the recent 2021 EPA legislation regarding PFAS, would you consider the threshold to be too conservative or not restrictive enough based on your studies? Ooh, that's a really complicated question. Um, so based on our studies, the concentrations that we're testing are uh, significantly higher than say the average environmental level detected. Um, so a lot of considerations have to be made about um, kind of, instead of looking at individual PFAS, looking at mixtures of PFAS. Um, so mixture, chemical mixtures can have uh, different types of effects potentially. Um, and you'd have to consider not only necessarily individual PFAS concentrations, but some PFAS concentrations. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on PFAS mixture toxicity investigation. Um, and then I think if I were thinking solely based on our studies, um, it's um, for the majority of the chemicals, we're not finding that they're very bioactive at low concentrations. So that in itself is um, kind of feels nice that we're not having to be super concerned that a lot of morphological effects are being observed at these really low concentrations that are close to the concentrations that are detected in the environment. Um, so I, once again, don't have a great answer for you on that. Um, but I'm hoping to learn more through my own research and uh, the field's really exploding right now. So I think as we gain more information, uh, especially about some PFAS and as analytical methods get better so that we can detect all of the PFAS out there so we can have a better idea of how much of them are summed together. Um, I think that will help the field a lot. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Mary reminded me that we had some questions from the Google form that people entered ahead of time. So you've answered some of them already, but I'm gonna pull a couple from there. So um, in the, the Google form, someone asked, knowing what you know about zebrafish and toxicity, what self-care practices do you pay attention to for your own detoxing? Uh, that is a good question. So um, in terms of detoxing, there's uh, not, not a good way to detox PFAS from your body, um, except for avoiding exposure in the first place. Um, I am not particularly uh, concerned. Uh, I think that a lot of my um, lifestyle habits are really in the same line of PFAS avoidance to begin with. <laughs> um, maybe not so much with COVID now um, because we have been say ordering out more um, and getting food in those carry out containers. Um, but uh, like, I will tell you, I, I use nonstick cookware in my kitchen and I have not vetted it for being PFAS free. Um, so I think in the context of my life, um, certain things like nonstick cookware is not a huge concern of mine. Um, and there are other ways that I look out for my chemical exposure, um, such as uh, like usually not using the carry out containers for food. Um, uh, 
trying to buy organic sometimes. That's not PFAS related, but pesticide related. Um, so there's a lot to worry about in life, and I try, I try to just do what I can. Thanks. So uh, Lindsay had a question. Excellent talk, Avon. My stream cut out a bit, so apologies if, if you already addressed this. Uh, I'm interested in the role of PFAS in firefighting foams, particularly what the debates are for weighing toxicity risk and the valuable role PFAS play in fire, fire suppression due to their unique properties. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, so I think that um, the argument that Cousins et al. made in his paper was that um, the majority of firefighting foams can now be um, uh, made with alternatives to PFAS. Um, so I think that PFAS um, in those capacities, the function is really essential, like putting out fires, saving lives, saving infrastructure. I think it's really important. I think there are other uh, PFAS alternatives that are coming to light now and that can be formulated into those. Um, as of a couple of years ago, uh, PFAS, certain, um, the US military required certain uh, aqueous film forming foams for fire fighting purposes to actually contain PFAS for their efficacy purposes. Um, I have not looked at whether that's changed in the last year or so. Um, but I think there's definitely other alternatives that can be used now. So I think it's really important to look into those uh, because uh, PFAS and PFOA, especially in say locations like surrounding military sites where a lot of uh, firefighting exercises do occur, um, there's significant, significantly higher contamination rates there. And those PFAS just stick in the environment um, and are there for a really long time. So I think it's definitely an important thing to weigh but luckily, I think we're finding more and more alternatives to PFAS in firefighting films. All right, we have one more question in the chat from, from Julie. And Julie says, I may have missed this, but why did you choose those particular chemicals in your research? Good question. Um, so looking at the first study where we looked at a lot of PFAS at one concentration, uh, we actually got those chemicals from a uh, company that produces analytical standards. So they were really high purity standards that we were really confident in. And it was a library that was already kind of available to us that we obtained from that company. Um, but it was really uh, suited our purposes really well because it did cover a huge span and uh, structurally diverse PFAS. Um, so that's the reason we chose uh, that initial library. And then in the second phase of our study where we narrowed in on uh, five structural subclasses and looked across concentrations, uh, we chose those as a result of um, finding that, for, for one thing, they were available as commercial reference standards. Uh, it's, it's actually pretty hard to get a hold of some of these PFAS and they're very expensive uh, for research purposes. So a good amount of that was just based on what was available. Um, but also all of those PFAS are really relevant um, for being detected in the environment. And then especially those uh, ether and polyether classes are seen as uh, newer, safer alternatives. So we were particularly interested to include some of those. Great, thank you, Yvonne. So as we're coming up to about 8.10, um, I think we'll kind of wrap up for this evening. Excellent response to all the questions and wonderful talk. I appreciate everyone being here this evening for Yvonne's presentation. I just wanna have a quick reminder, our next Tap Talk will be June 1st at 7 p.m. So again, the first Tuesday of the month in June. And we will be focusing on No Food Left Behind, which is an organization here in Corvallis. And Jeanette Hardison and Linda Siebing will be presenting on Kitchen Confessionals, where we'll be listening or sharing what gets wasted most in your home kitchen and their creative new ideas, tools, and techniques for wasting less food. We'll also be talking a bit about composting. So hopefully you'll be able to join us for that talk. And thank you again, Yvonne, for a wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot and have um, appreciate zebra for, zebrafish even more now. So excellent job. And thank you everyone for being here. Hopefully we'll see you in June. Thanks.
Thanks, Ashley.